Thank you, Congressman King. Oh, yeah. I just want to say something first. Representative Thompson has been working very hard on this issue, and he is very sorry he cannot come here tonight. So I just wanted to tell you that he has been in the forefront of the fight in the House, but he cannot make it. Um, so the other thing I want to say is we need to have Doug Campbell in the Iowa Senate from Senate District 30. So if you're... He will stand up for your private property rights. If you're in that district, help him win. If you're not in that district, help him win. <laughs> Do whatever you can, because we need him. We don't need another Senate session without Doug Campbell there, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, if you doubt that, ask my wife how stubborn I am. <laughs> so um, please consider a generous donation this evening to help out this cause before you go. And these signs up here are for sale. And how much? Or take them. Or take them. If you have a good location for those signs, you would like to uh, make a donation, please make a generous free will donation for this evening. Um, I want to leave you with this statement. Karl Marx stated that the philosophy of communism can be condensed into one sentence, the abolition of private property. Thank you for this evening. Now we'll go into questions and answers. And I, do you have a? I'll run out there. And first question, who wants to ask first question? There we go. He, he got there before we did. And we'll pass around the mic. I'd like somebody to mention the conflicts of interest among the Reynolds administration, the UIB, and Summit Navigator. I think I got it. Um, a lot of conflicts of interest on the pipeline route. So number one, Former Governor Branstead is um, one of the strategic partners for Summit. We have um, Secretary Vilsack's son, Jess Vilsack, who's general counsel for Summit. Um, we have, I'm trying to think of all the other ones. Eric Branstead. I don't think he works for the for Summit. Um, I'm trying, oh, um, Jake Ketzner, who is the lobbyist for Summit, was the former chief of staff for uh, Kim Reynolds and for Branstead and then there's a couple more I'm trying to remember we had this we used to have this pipeline the revolving door pipeline sheet of all the connections and I'm trying to think of the other ones what oh yeah Busolo who's been on the subcommittee for our bills and has been holding up our bills in the Senate he used to work for Summit Ag so I mean this is so intertwined in the different players Boondoggle. Oh yeah, Josh Burns, who's on the Iowa Utilities Board, his daughter was the executive assistant for Governor Reynolds. <laughs> Eric Helen, to that, that one I don't, I'm, I just have not, I have not backed this up and I can't find anything, but it's ironic that Eric owns a company called 49th Summit out of Alaska, but I have not found a tie between 49th Summit and Summit, but it is an, an interesting combo. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I don't know anyone with the mic. Someone else said someone back there. I think those are all the connections that we know, but there could be a few more. <laughs> I'm just curious how uh, the senator who authored Senate File 411, is he free to walk around? Because he should be charged with perjury. He committed perjury against his oath of office by authoring a con constitutional bill. And I think we need to hold ourselves accountable, but we also need to hold our elected officials accountable. And I don't know why we don't do that, because that is something that, I just took the oath of office myself here not too long ago to be on a city council. And I take it seriously. <clears throat> and I know my good friend Corey takes this very seriously. And I know that Doug will and Sandy will. 
But it's time that we actually charge these people, and as Congressman King, I know you would know how to do that. So I think it's time that we actually put teeth in this oath and demand that they, that they stand up, like uh, I think it was Sheriff Mack who said that they commit either perjury or treason, one or the other. Well, I do know, I do know that um, during the um, peak of the Tea Party effort that I was involved in, um, we passed a rule in the U.S. House that any bill that was introduced, you had to cite the section of the Constitution uh, that, that made it constitutional uh, so that it wasn't ambiguous. And that started out pretty good and clean, and then it kind of slid down to uh, necessary and proper, and it became the catch-all. It's awfully hard to hold people to this. In the end, it's their conscience that has to hold them accountable. And yes, they need to be reminded. And we need to elect people to office that are going to hold their principles together, like I'm confident you are. And then, once we're able to elect those kind of people, then we have to have their back because these other forces are pushing on them constantly. And they've got to, they need to see you at the city council meetings and at the county supervisors meetings and at the state legislature so that so that they know that they've got a core of people that want to make sure that they are true to the principles that got them elected to office. I think that's the best thing we can do. It's hard to get down that other path, though. It is. Who else do we have to primary to get this thing fixed down in Des Moines? Oh, no, I want, na I want names, please. In the Senate, the you know Senator Whitver is our Senate Majority Leader, and I think we need Senator Brown, who is the Senate or the Chair of the Commerce Committee, Senator Mike Busolo, who's been on the subcommittee, who's held up our bill. Um, we could go through a bunch more in the Senate, but the, or Senator Sinclair, who's in charge of putting bills into different committees and deciding which bills move forward. I'd say those are the biggest targets in the Senate. And then in the House, um, we have Representative Pat Grassley, who did move our bill last year, but we're really struggling to get our bill moving in the House this year. Um, we have Representative Matt Winshittle, who's in the House, and he's the one who picks which bills move and get into what committee, and he right now is, is one of the reasons our bill is not moving in the House. Um, so really take a look at the list of leaders. Um, because right now what we're hearing, because we're at the Capitol every single week, and most of the you know, rank and file senators and representatives are with us. It's leadership, and it's Governor Reynolds. That's, that's probably the top of the pyramid right now of who's controlling the legislature and making sure our bills don't go through. We've been trying to meet with Governor Reynolds for three years. We stop by her office, we send emails, we make calls asking for a meeting, and nope, doesn't have time for us, but she has time for lots of other things. Okay, I got some uh, question I'd like to ask. Every, probably everybody here tonight are probably close to farmers or did farming. We got to get the urban people involved in this also. We can't do this alone. Um, Steve King touched on, he talked about Larry Fink. Do you know what Larry Fink does? He's the CEO of BlackRock and they hold $9 trillion worth of assets. Now, if you think you're gonna fight them in court, we haven't got enough money here. There ain't none of us here got enough to match that. So we've got to, we've got to come up with a, a bigger um, army, whatever you want to call it, but fight this the smart way. Also, I got a question, and I'm so happy that Sandy brought up the um, scripture lessons. Um, I've got one I've always asked people. Uh, this, um, this CO2 stuff is nothing more than a scam. There's absolutely nothing that anybody's going to benefit from this. And every time you hear somebody say net zero carbon by 2050, do you know what that means? Does anybody know what Mars looks like? <laughs> That's what we will be. Because right now, everybody here is giving off CO2. And if you can't do that, you're not here. And it, so my uh, question is what I'd like to know and this is also from the Bible, if all the rivers on the earth are running into the ocean, why isn't the ocean full? Anybody know? 
there's, don't tell me that the oceans rise it either because it didn't. But uh, a gentleman back here, the good Lord set it up that way and he's the one in charge and he's the one in charge of our atmosphere and our climate. And I think people need to remember that. It's, it's way beyond us. Yeah, I'd like to ask the girl on the corner there. She brought up about uh, uh, Kim Reynolds. And what I was wondering is, why is that that if she's involved with Summit, why is she such a good leader? That, that's what I wanted to know. I think that's a really good question right now because you know, the people of Iowa, farmers, landowners who are impacted right now by something that's threatening their livelihoods, I think that's a priority. That should be a priority to our governor. And we've literally shown up at her office. We have written emails and calls. And she's never met with us. But we did an open records request, and we uncovered that she meets with Rastetter. She attempts to meet with Rastetter on a quarterly basis. They have dinner dinner reservations and lunch reservations and they go out of their way to clear their schedules to meet with each other. Mm -hmm. And that kind of access, because he has money and power, is not okay with me. I think our elected officials, especially our governor, is put in office to protect us. And if she's not willing to do that, we need someone who will. So that's a really, a really good question. I don't know why uh, she's not listening to us. Well, well you know... <laughs> What'd that? you say? <laughs> yeah, it'd be better. <laughs> well, what I'd like to say is, what I'd like to say is that I've been down to the Capitol, you know, and and what's funny about that is we go, and what does Kim? She runs around worrying about the schools. They're not thinking about the children out here with the land and the other part, and it's and it's sad, but. Our president is exactly the same, you know. He, he's, he's, you know, you could, he can stand up there for. Actually, you, you, like the other night, I listened to him on TV, and he actually tells so many lies during his uh, address that you get to really believe in that that stuff's the truth, and ain't even, ain't even close. <laughs> Well, thanks. Yeah. If anyone does happen to show up at a meeting where Kim Reynolds is there, like take that opportunity. We've been waiting for three years for it. Speak up. Ask her a tough question. <laughs> any more? Any more questions? A comment about getting the urban people involved. I don't know what the answer is, but this is one point that really bothers me. We are in a drought, our aquifers are way below normal levels and they're dropping. And if people in the cities don't start understanding, first of all, where their water actually comes from besides just turning on the faucet, they need to know they're in danger as well. We've already got cities in Iowa who are rationing water. They've got schools that are telling their kids to flush once a day. It's, it's, it's gonna get worse. And that may be the way to get them to wake up because everybody's in their own little bubble and they don't care. Well, yeah. <laughs> the other comment I want to make is alluding to what Steve said about crossing state boundaries, that it's more than one state. I could get really nasty with my language here, but I, I've been gone to the Capitol a lot of weeks. Like Jeff says, we're down there every week. I am so ticked off at our legislators blowing us off. And they're sitting, we talked to some House representatives. Oh, we can't do anything because they're not gonna do anything on the Senate side. BS, get off your duffs, talk to your comrades, talk to each other, get something done for the Iowa people. And the same thing on the federal level. When I've contacted Senator Grassley and Senator Ernst, the response is, well, that's a state issue. That's not a federal issue. That's garbage. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. I had something burning on my mind, and that actually triggers it. Um, <laughs> so uh, 
Yes, I've heard that from a, a number of our members of Congress that it's not our problem, this is a state issue, don't bother me with it. There's a narrative you all need to know. And that was um, year ago last summer, I believe it was, when they had the debt ceiling bill coming before the, to the floor of the United States House of Representatives. And it was one of only two leverage bills they had on the Senate and on the President uh, to try to get anything done. And so what they sought to do was to cut the budget down and get, and get some more fiscal responsibility into that. I know the people that wrote the bill. I can't tell you more than that about them, or they might. They just, I just don't, I promised I wouldn't. But I know them very, very well. And they wrote the bill. And one of the things they did in this debt ceiling bill was they, they, they um, repealed these carbon credits that are putting all this pressure down on us. The hundreds of billions of dollars in carbon credits were written in as a, as a repeal in that bill. And it was a must-pass piece of legislation. They had in a closed room with 200 and some House Republicans, they all agreed to vote for this bill as it was except I'm not sure how our delegation, whether they agreed on that in that room or not. But it was coming to the floor on a Thursday. At 2.30 in the morning, on that Thursday morning, our four members of the House, of the Iowa, all Republicans, were in Kevin McCarthy's office, I'll say this, virtually pounding on his desk, demanding that those carbon credits be put back in that bill. And, they, they, I've never seen any of them take a leadership on anything before, but they took leadership on this. It's not the style of, let's just say, a Randy Feenstra, whom I'm watching more closely, to go in and pound on the desk of Kevin McCarthy. He never owned an issue all along, but now he owns this one, and the Iowa delegation owns this one, and there was, they had, McCarthy had no choice but to put those carbon credits back in the bill, which is what enables this full court press on our property rights and our budget and our taxpayer dollars since that time. They actually, they came home and, and they bragged about saving ethanol. But I, I know what happened. And uh, not only that, I have it on very good authority that Governor Reynolds called near that same time or that night and call, asked for those credits to be put back in the bill. If they had done their job and put those credits in there and left them in there and defended the bill itself, there's a chance that the leverage of that might have actually killed this off. I don't know that that would happen, but that was the path down the road. So I will say this, what motivates the governor and the four members of the Iowa congressional delegation all simultaneously to be pushing on Kevin McCarthy? Did they wake up sometime or read an article in the paper somewhere or watch the news and decide, I'm going to, I'm going to call the, I'll call the Speaker of the House, or I'm going to go in and pound on his desk. Oh, I'm going to say this. This is speculation, but I know I'm right. They got a call from Bruce Rastetter, and he animated that. And, that, and so that's also on our congressional delegation. They need to be called to, called to account for that. But I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks. Any more, any more questions? Just put it in here, and then they can come up. And okay, speak I have to release it. Relinquish yeah, it. Just go ahead. And if you want to speak, just come up and speak here. A question for uh, Steve King. How much is Stomach and Bruce Rafsett are going to get in federal tax credits per year on this? That his company and him will get for federal tax credits? Here. My question is, when it comes to federal tax credits, how much will Summit and Bruce Rafsett get per year? Um, I've got a, I have a look, I built a spreadsheet on this a year, a year ago, not quite a year ago, and so I'm guessing a little bit now if I've got to go from memory, but it is billions of dollars, and that number changes a little bit because they've expanded this thing. The original one, it seemed to me, hmm, I'm a little afraid to say, but it seems to me that if the original plan between Summit and, uh, and uh, also Navigator, then the Wolf plan together, triggered something like $19 billion a year. But it's more than that now. And so that's, but this thing all together adds up to hundreds of billions of dollars. Is if you, let's see, it's gonna come to me, I think. 17.1 billion, I believe was the number now, because, no, 17.9. $17.9 billion a year because I put it into a 10-year budget and it was $179 billion in a 10-year budget. That's what that's projected to be. But of course, um, there's a lot of things they can do with that CO2. And what it says is really is that we all would pay for the infrastructure construction, all the pipelines, set that all up, 
and hand it over to him. We'd pay it through the carbon credits, and then he's sitting there with pipeline connection to every ethanol plant, and he can control the valve at every ethanol plant to decide, are we gonna take the CO2 or aren't we gonna take it? Are we gonna make them release it into the atmosphere? Do we have a better market for it someplace else? And he can starve down the ethanol plants in the same way. If he just shuts down the emissions, the, CO, the, the transfer of the CO2 emissions, the ethanol plants can have their, mar their, their corn markets crunch down and their ethanol market cr crunch down too. I wouldn't wanna be on, on a board of directors of an ethanol plant and having Bruce Raster, here's how it, um, I'll say this, I've got a good friend that was giving me some of this narrative along the way and it's an ethanol plant that was set up, really one of the early ones that's set up right and it's still right. And uh, he said that Rastetter came to them and said, I've got a deal for you, I'll take this CO2 off of your hands and then that will lower your carbon credit and you can sell ethanol to California. And they said, that sounds like maybe too good to be true, Bruce, let's think about it and we'll talk another time. So about two meetings later he came back and the proposal was that, um, let's see, it was, he was gonna split the 45Z credit, which is a dollar up to a dollar a gallon for every gallon of ethanol that, that qualifies for the lowering the carbon credit. He was gonna split some of that and still take the $85 off. So essentially, he was reaching into the ethanol plant's um, pie as well. And, but the, uh, the fellow on the board told me that day, that's been a year ago, October, when he told me this, he said that we're gonna make $400, $400 million out of this deal. We'll make more money out of the CO2 than we will out of ethanol. So that's a pretty big bait, but now, uh, Doyle would tell you, we don't know any plant that's talking about cashing in on 45Z. So that means they've got nothing coming on that and uh, still faced with the idea they've got contracts signed and they need to have some help to figure out how to get out of those contracts. I'm sure that they've been misrepresented in some fashion or another and you can break a contract by doing that. But that's 179, 179 billion on what they say for out of 10 year, uh, 17.9 billion. It took me a while to get that dusted off, but that's the number, I'm sure. One other question too is if you wanna see what your politicians are being bought and paid off to, Go to Open Secrets and you'll see how much uh, mm -hmm. the politicians are being bought off by Bruce Rathsetter. And that's Open Secrets. That's right. And, um, and I'd even go, there's, there's a few more things on that. Bruce Rastetter maxed out $6,600 to each of the Iowa House members. And written about the same time was a $6,600 check to each one of them from Paul Singer. Paul Singer is the number one vulture capitalist in the United States of America. And, uh, and, and he's, um, he's a guy that took down Cabela's and um, out in Sydney, Nebraska, took a big hit out there when, when uh, Bass Pro ended up with it. Paul Singer uh, banked about $100 million over that transaction. He he's so Bass cold Bass. and ruthless that he bought discounted bonds from Argentina on, for penny, a penny or pennies on the dollar. And he found a way to impound an Argentinian warship in a harbor in West Africa until they paid up 100 cents on the dollar on its bonds, or at least whatever that he had negotiated with them. This guy is cold and he is ruthless, and he's a guy that's close to Rastetter. I remember I took a ride with Rastetter for about an hour and a half, maybe 10 years ago or so, and uh, we're around one of those little green buggies around his place, and three times he mentioned Paul Singer's name. That's when I started to pay attention. So there's some cold-eyed, ruthless people here on that side, not to mention the Chinese money in Smithfield and Syngenta, Chinese-owned. And we have a law in Iowa that says that uh, for, we can't have foreign ownership of farmland. That was passed in 1980. And yet we've got large companies that are in here that want to have access to our private property rights. And, and Summit says, but it's a national security issue, we can't tell you where the, where we can't tell you what the plume study is gonna be because maybe there'd be some Chinese terrorists that would go and blow up the pipeline. And so, well, that's, I bet they already know. Smithfield and Syngenta already know. And there's probably other cash in there too, along with South Korea, a lot, who has, so what is it, SK company out of South Korea? They have 45% uh, of their employees are in red China and they're all over the place. So this is an international behemoth that has been constructed under Bruce Rastetter. And he, we ought to be point, um, you know, just we may not have quite the same opinion of George Soros, but I'm gonna just say this. Whatever a lot of you might think of George Soros, Bruce Rastetter is the George Soros for the upper Midwest. And he's hitting us a lot harder than Soros is these days. So I just think we have to demonize that guy as he earned it. Last question. Three quick things. One, 
I remember the Parents Matter placards that were around in our 2022 elections for Governor Reynolds. Why not we throw one back at her that says property rights matter? Two, can we get access to that PowerPoint presentation, please? And three, how many of us can help Doug Campbell with a little bit of door knocking before the primary that live close to him? Because it's, it's a lot of ground to cover. That's all I have to say. God bless one and all. Thank you. That wraps up our evening, courtesy of our panel and COPSA. <laughs>